working half day, dorm counselor at Neve, the best, the best. But then I got kicked out of Neve. I got kicked out my first year in Neve, and I got kicked out my last year in Neve. What for? First year in Neve, I got kicked out for graffitiing a wall. Beautiful graffiti. Anyway, got kicked out. We worked it out that I would live in an apartment down the hill. I couldn't stay in the dorm. I'd have to come to davening every day and straighten myself out. Uh, and I did that, and eventually they let me back into the dorm. Um, and then when I was dorm counselor, I got kicked out. Uh, it was a series of events. You, you have to know Neve to kind of to really appreciate. What kind of yeshiva is Neve? Neve, I would say, is a yeshiva. It is a Torah learning yeshiva for the bad boys of Orthodox Judaism, not criminals. Yeah. Uh, I think it's evolved into something else nowadays. Yeah. Um, because a lot more kids are doing drugs. Back then, it wasn't really a, a drug group. It was more uh, just guys that played hockey and, you know, it just it didn't fit the mold of regular yeshivas. Yeah. This was the place to go. The Torah learning was great because it was a different format. Yes, you sat in front of a Gemara and you learned Baba Metzia and you learned about cows and this the business and trading and stuff. But the Rebbe kind of tweaked it a bit and made it cool and made it exciting. You're like, God damn, this stuff is cool. Yeah. And then you're digging it. Yeah. And now you love it. So the learning was great. The rabbis were great because they were cool too. The rabbi, the, the Rosh Yeshiva then, was a rabbi in TA in the school in my yeshiva in Baltimore uh -huh. back in the day. So I had known him. His wife was, when I was in like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, was, uh, she tutored me in uh -huh. school. Uh -huh. So for me it was an easy fit, and the the freedom there was was great. I had a lot of freedom to do what I wanted to do, and choose to learn Torah. The ability to choose rather than being forced yeah. is a big deal. It makes yeah. a big difference, especially for guys that like me. That was great. And uh, how did you come to take the discovery seminars? So the discovery. So when I got kicked out of. Neve the second time, mm -hmm. which was for, you know, there was bowling balls and bowling pins involved and water fights and floods and, you know, uh, the one of the rabbis at Neve was a student of Rav Noach Weinberg at Aish, and unbeknownst to me, he calls me into his office, he said, someone just called here to speak to you, and I got on the phone with Noach Weinberg. Noah Weinberg. I heard the name. Yes, he's the guy from Age. I didn't really appreciate his role uh, in in Judaism until, you know, after I got off the phone, it was explained to me. Um, but I said to the rabbi, the rabbi said, "Listen, I hear you're having some problems at your yeshiva over there." I said, hey, "You call them problems. I call them, you know, growing growing pains." He said, "Why don't you come learn over here at Age?" I said. Asia is about tshuva. I don't know. Is it going to be okay? He's like, come on down. I said, I'll make you a deal, Rabbi. You learn with me an hour a day, you got me. And he did for months. I learned with Noah Weinberg for an hour a day. Sometimes it was a half hour, but he always stood by it. We learned together. Um, and one of the things that he insisted on was that uh, was that I take the discovery class. for what I, unbeknownst to me. But beknownst to many others, mm -hmm. I was an asset to the Jewish people. <laughs> and he said, "Look, you have a lot to give, and you have a great." I have my old discovery book, and I had it autographed by Rav Noah, by Rabbi Ari Khan, Mati Berger, a whole bunch of the teachers there. I have it autographed by. And Rav Noah wrote something, and I, obviously I can't write; I have to look back at it. Um, but it was something that I could change the world. And I took Discovery, and a whole different outlook on Torah from what I had grown up with the previous, you know, 20 years at that point. Um, and I took it again and again and again, I, I, seven times probably. Uh, and I met a rabbi there, and I hung out with this guy. This guy's so smart. Uh, and I said, Rabbi, wherever you go, I'm going. Yeah. Wherever you're speaking, I'm speaking. I'm there. I'm listening. And it was great. And before I left for Israel, they sent me up to Tzfat. I learned there for a short while. 
um, with a guy named Gedalia Gerfine. Very cool guy. He used to be like a writer for Letterman or Saturday Night Live or whatever. And here he is in the hippie town of Tzvat, rocking. The guy was very cool. Um, but Tzvat was, was interesting because, it, you know, you go to sleep there and you dream, and the dreams are like watching a movie, like that vivid. You know, you come back to America, you barely remember your dreams. Over there, choo -hoo. Hmm. Impressive stuff. I liked Tzvat a lot. A little too slow for my blood, yeah. but, but I dug it for a short spurt. I'm not sure I can handle all the, the metaphysics over there. So how did you discover what you were good at? I'm not, I think as you grow, as you grow, you learn the different things that you're good at. When you're saying, what are you referring to? Primarily your music. Didn't know. Did it, did, I always knew that I always, I always had rhythm. And I always knew I loved, loved music. Even growing up in NCSY as a young, young teenager, um, I was always involved in the band that played, and I'd be on stage dancing and rapping, and I was in the music, involved. It did something to me. It was powerful. It never in a million years that I think I could make a living out of it. Yeah. But uh, but I did know that I loved it, like more than just rudimentary listening on the radio. I love being involved with it. I love the my brain worked in connecting wires to this and that and make this sound and it. I don't know how to play an instrument. I never, because I was a wild kid, I didn't have the patience to sit down and learn. Um, but when I, but here's the the blessing. All the times that I would get suspended from school, my mom would take me from Baltimore to my grandparents in New York for the days that we were off. We would take a train up. We'd stay there a couple days. My grandparents lived in Brooklyn, and at the time I was nine, ten years old, eight, nine, ten. Uh, and it was right around when when hip hop was was coming into place. And I had early nineties. No, oh, late seventies, early eighties. Oh, <laughs> yeah, nine, eight, nine, ten years old. And he, they, um, and I had a friend who was a Puerto Rican kid and a black kid. Uh -huh. Right, they lived in the building across the street. And every time I came in. I would call them, let them know I was in, and we would hang out. We'd play wall ball and stick ball, and they would play for me these cassette tapes of these this music that they would get from a friend of theirs somewhere. And that was what was to become hip hop, you know. And to me, it was great because you heard these scratching sounds and thumping beats. You heard people screaming in the background, yeah, people loving it, and that was kind of my first foray into what was to become. Rap. I eventually, and I used to see graffiti on the subway trains. Ten-year-old kid to see this. It, to me, it was beautiful. I, you know, obviously Mayor Koch had a whole different outlook on it. But to me, I still have books and books of graffiti, of, of whole photo journals of the different graffiti subway trains and everything that was out there. Uh, that was that. I loved that, and I loved when I, as I got older, and I started doing more and more. Rapping, just the rhyming yeah. on the beat yeah. and the rhyme. I would go back to my youth group, NCSY, and I'd be rapping. And I was the Orthodox Jewish. I was break dancing. I had a big boombox. Is this in high school? This is the yeah, like nine, eh, ninth grade, ninth grade. I would say, right when hip hop, like right before Run DMC made it big. You know, it, it, in Baltimore, they didn't know about rap yet. MTV was barely. A thing, yeah, and and but I had songs that I would get for Brooklyn, and I'd bring them down, and it would come. You know, Run DMC just started, Curtis Blow, The Treacherous Three, uh, Grandmaster Melly Mel, the old school hip hoppers, and in the shul lobbies, I'd have the boombox, and right after a session or a meal, I'd be there break dancing. Girls would be all kind of guys would be hanging around. The band would be playing. I'd get up there. I'd start rapping. I wrote some of the parodies for the band that was to become Schlock Rock. You know, Walk This Way became Wash This Way. Jam On It became Bless On It. You know, it, it just, that's the way it worked. And, uh, I mean, everybody, I had parachute pants. I had the whole, the, the Run DMC look. I mean, it was, it was great. That was when hip-hop was, was, it was pure. Where, where are you in the birth order? I am the oldest. I have a sister. I'm an adopted child, born of Persian parents.